So this, uh, this lecture um, goes through each of the tasks for a typical environmental flow assessment. Now, there are a number of different types of environmental flow assessment uh, at different levels of detail. And this is based mainly on the holistic methodologies such as the building block methodology um, as, as a typical method. But most of the tasks are quite common to most of the more detailed methods. Okay, so this, this gives an overview of the different tasks, and I'll go through each of them in, in more detail. So called stage A scoping, where one's looking at the, the river generally, um, doing a, a general survey of the river to get an idea of the whole uh, study area of interest. Then into stage B, preparation for the environmental flow assessment workshop with a number of, of different tasks, which I'll go through in, in detail, appointing the assessment team, zoning the study area, habitat integrity assessment, selecting sites for detailed studies, then the surveys and measurements, the, uh, the field tasks, the ecological and social importance and sensitivity, defining reference conditions, defining present ecological status, and defining obje uh, environmental objectives. Uh, then stage C, the actual environmental flow assessment workshop, where the flows are actually assessed by the different specialists. Stage D is a negotiation uh, process where the recommended flows are then, uh, the recommended environmental flows are then added in with the user requirements in terms of domestic, agricultural, industrial, and so on uh, uses to see whether the, uh, the flows in the river can meet all those requirements and the environmental flows, uh, and if not, obviously there have, have to be um, negotiation and compromises. And then finally, implementation and compliance monitoring, which is a long-term, uh, basically uh, indefinite part of the process. Okay, so the scoping... This would be an initial assessment of the area of interest to try to identify issues of particular importance and to draw up an initial plan for the assessment. This phase can also include a first stage uh, environmental flow assessment using lookup tables such as the Tennant Montana methodology or a hydrological analysis such as the uh, index of hydrological uh, alteration or an extrapolation approach such as Dennis Hughes desktop method to provide a reconnaissance level estimate of the probable volume and distribution of water required to meet a variety of environmental conditions. Okay, so after, the, after this initial scoping, the preparation for the assessment workshop, there are 10 steps in this preparation and they involve uh, all the different specialists, sometimes working cooperatively, sometimes ca carrying out tasks separately. So the first uh, task to initiate the assessment, um, to decide on the level of detail and define what methodology is going to be used. Uh, and this task is going to depend on the urgency of the problem, the data availability. In other words, if you have very little hydrological uh, data, then it probably isn't worth spending a lot of time and effort getting very detailed ecological data because the, the uh, lack of hydrological uh, data confidence is going to uh, govern the, the confidence of the results. Um, the resources available, time, money, expertise, <clears throat> the importance of the river in terms of uh, environmental issues, the present and future river use, the complexity of the system, and the difficulty of implementing the flows, whether you have structures which can release flows, whether you've got a good demand management policy framework, and so on. Okay, so that's initiating and deciding on the methodology. Appointment of the assessor, assessment team, which will typically be led by a project manager or co coordinator uh, who will have an environmental flow assessment facilitator, somebody who understands the whole process, who understands where the different disciplines fit in, and then the various uh, specialists, a hydrologist, a hydraulic surveyor and modeler to provide the rated cross-sections, geomorphologists to deal with sediment and channel uh, shape, uh, 
water quality specialist, and then a variety of ecologists, usually a fish ecologist, benthic invertebrate and riparian vegetation, but also possibly water birds, amphibians, phytozooplankton, microflora, and so on. And then a uh, sociologist and a resource economist to uh, look at the various uh, aspects of people use of the river and the costs and benefits of different management strategies. Uh, task three, zoning the study area to identify reaches of the study river in which the physical and ecological conditions are likely to be similar so that uh, they can be dealt with as, as, uh, as particular uh, sections of, the, uh, of the, the river for which the flows can be recommended as the same. The, those uh, zones are usually defined by major changes in channel size, hydrology, geology, gradient or land use. Um, where tributaries come in and so on. So detailed studies will be based on sample sites and the ideal is to locate one site for each zone that will characterise the conditions throughout that zone. Okay, here's an example of zonation for the upper and middle reaches of the Ganga River in India where, where we ended up with seven uh, different zones uh, from Gangotri up in the, uh, in the Himalayas, down to Kanpur uh, in the middle reaches. Five zones mainly defined in terms of, um, of uh, um, gradient uh, of the river as it flattened out, reaching its uh, floodplain uh, sections, but also defined by things like where there were major barriers, uh, barrages and, and different land uses and so on. Okay, habitat integrity is a really an overall sur survey of the condition of the section of the river of interest and the aim is to classify the section in terms of how much they've been modified from natural conditions. <coughs> Often done as this one was uh, through a, a helicopter video survey, in this case with the Sabi River looking at five kilometre uh, river sectors where the dark green section next to the Mozambique border is the riparian, is natural riparian habitat integrity. The riparian habitat being the, the uh, colours below the river channels and the uh, in-stream habitat integrity being the colours above the, uh, the uh, river channel. So the greener it is, the more natural, and the browner it is, the more degraded. And this just provides an overall uh, view of the river so that where you then put the sites marked here in red as IFR 1, 2, in-stream flow requirement 1, 2, 3, up to uh, 8 sites on the main Sabi and its tributaries, um, so that where these sites are located can be um, representative of the different zones and we know what's going on upstream and downstream. Of them, So that's the overall habitat integrity. Then site selection within that, within each zone, which will, the criteria, main criteria will be ease of accessibility, the habitat diversity for the ecologists, the sensitivity of habitats to flow changes. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, river pools are not normally very sensitive. The, the level will more or less stay the same until the, the flow stops. But... Uh, Riffles and rapids are very sensitive and will, uh, uh, the amount of habitat and the depth and the velocities will change with changing flows. The suitability for measuring a rated hydraulic cross-section and for modelling discharges, velocities and wetted perimeter at different water depths. The proximity to a flow gauging site so that we can know what the flow is coming down the river without having to estimate them each time representation of conditions in the, the river zone. Uh, is, is this a typical part of the river zone? Is it a critical part of the river zone? Um, is it sensitive to flow changes and so on? Uh, and, uh, and so is it a critical flow site, i.e. where the flow will stop first if discharges are reduced so that you're getting the most sensitivity to flow changes? Okay, then surveys and, and measurements. Here you've got the different biological surveys, fish communities, benthic invertebrates, riparian vegetation and the other groups if necessary. Hydraulic survey and, and analysis to provide the rated cross-sections or habitat modelling. Um, uh, 
to provide the link between ecological knowledge and the flows required to maintain the habitats and that the accuracy of that hydraulic survey and modelling is crucial to the confidence of the overall process. The hydrological analysis similarly uh, the flow record, hopefully uh, a long historical flow record so that we know the different um, flows that are, that are happening in the uh, river channel and the, and the flood plain uh, and is used to check the recommended uh, ecological flows that they're within reasonable limits of the flows expected in the, in the river. The geomorphological survey uh, to analyse channel morphology um, and predict consequences of changing flows on sediment input output and therefore on the channel shape, uh, substrate types and habitat types. The water quality analysis, water quality requirements are assessed in parallel with the flow requirements to identify point and diffuse uh, runoff impacts in order to be able to predict what will be the water quality changes with differing flows. And then the social surveys, there are really two types of, of survey associated with um, the kind of building block type methodology. First of all, the identification of people who are directly dependent on a healthy riverine ecosystem um, to identify aspects of the flow regime that are important for each use. So maybe for recreational or commercial fishing, whitewater rafting, people who are using water directly from the river, who are watering their animals in the river, uh, other recreational aspects and so on. And then the second one is a consultation and capacity building with all relevant uh, stakeholders or representatives of stakeholder groups to identify preferences for the management objectives for the river. It's a very important part of the of the process to make sure that you've got buy-in from the stakeholders. So consultation and capacity building with all stakeholders to identify preferences for the management objectives for the river is an overarching framework for the whole process. Okay, here's just an example of the characterization of a particular site uh, in the Ruaha River in, uh, in uh, Tanzania, um, just to, uh, to give an example of the kind of specific site on which the detailed work would be done on the fish, riparian vegetation, geomorphology and so on. Okay, and there's the, the, uh, some of the fish sampling being done at that site. Okay, task seven, ecological and social importance and sensitivity. Um, the ecological importance is a measure of the priority of the area of interest interest from an ecological perspective and the social importance is a measure of people's dependence on the healthy riverine environment for goods and services, recreation and cultural and spiritual values of the river. So that would be an important part of, of uh, providing the uh, framework for setting the objectives for the environmental flows. Task 8, defining reference conditions, the background template um, which would usually be natural conditions um, but might be in rivers which have been modified over a very long period and, and uh, so the natural condition is just simply not a, a realistic um, uh, reference point to go back to um, in which case one's got to decide at what stage uh, to set the reference conditions um, in terms of the utilisation of the river. So they'll provide a baseline against which to judge how much the river has been modified and in order to decide has it been too much modified and do we need to improve it or is it all right to just uh, maintain present conditions. Okay, task nine, uh, defining present ecological status. The purpose is to compare present conditions with the reference conditions to measure how far the river has been modified over time. And this pro process provides the basis for the definition of the environmental objectives. So here's an example of a table where we're looking at different components, water quality, geomorphology, riparian vegetation, fish, aquatic invertebrates, and an overall what we call eco-status um, in terms of the present ecological state, how much it's changed from the reference condition, in terms of the long-term change. So in other words, if the management of the river goes on as it has been, what would be the change over the long term? And there you can see in terms of the geomorphology, 
that the prediction would be that the, there's, a, there's a negative change where the present ecological state is a BC class in terms of A being natural, B slightly modified, C moderately modified, uh, D significantly modified, um, and, uh, well, it doesn't go beyond that in this case, but it could go to E or F, which are, uh, are very severely uh, modified. So um, the long-term change for geomorphology would be predicted that it would change from a BC slightly to moderately modified to definitely moderately modified. The uh, fish component presently at a moderately modified C class in, uh, with present management conditions would deteriorate to a D or, or se uh, severely modified um, condition. Okay, so that's the long-term change. The ecological importance and sensitivity, uh, which is a general, uh, not component-by-component component assessment, would be high in this uh, hypothetical case. And from that, the ecological management class, or what would be the class that uh, the specialists would consider to be, uh, to, uh, be the requirement for the environmental flows. And in this case, you can see that to maintain the present class in most cases, in fact in all cases, would be the objective. So the present ecological state is felt to be um, sufficiently good to meet the uh, stakeholder objectives, but in order to meet those objectives, one would have to bear in mind that there are negative changes in the long term going to go on unless there's an improved management process. So that's a, a, a summary of, of those aspects of the assessment. All right, so 10 to, uh, to define the environmental objectives. There's no single correct environmental flow for any given river. The question is how much impact is acceptable and what are the goods and services that the various stakeholders expect from the river and uh, what, what objectives could be achieved or should be achieved by managing the river. Okay, then stage C is the environmental flow assessment workshop. Depending on what methodology is being used, this process may take many different forms, but essentially different comprehensive methodologies, such as the building block methodology, uh, such as the drift process, um, represent different ways of processing and analysing the same information. So you should get the same answers if you're using the same information and the same specialist, no matter what method is being used. And an example process let's say, for the building block methodology. At the assessment workshop, flow recommendations are decided by the whole group of specialists. For each recommended flow, and that might be dry season base flow, wet season base flow, higher flows and floods, the specialists consider what habitats should be inundated, current velocities will be needed, river width and so on, be required to meet the objectives to provide the habitats uh, for the biodiversity and the different uses of the river. The hydrologist uh, then checks if the recommended flow is realistic in terms of the flow patterns experience at that point in the river and at the environmental flow assessment workshop the water quality specialist will respond to the recommended flows by estimating or predicting the consequences of those flows on the concentrations of various water quality parameters to indicate whether water quality uh, guidelines are going to be met. Okay, this is just a, a, a group of pictures of different uh, rivers and, and different uh, uh, stages of the process of the field work and the, uh, the assessment workshop for the uh, Mara top uh, left there, the Ganga River on the top right, the... Um, Ruvu, Wami Ruvu in Tanzania uh, on, the, on the left and, the, um, and uh, the, uh, some of the upper reaches of the Amazon in Ecuador on the, right, on the bottom right. Okay, stage D is the negotiation. So once the environmental flows have been assessed, this stage addresses the analysis and decision-making process. It's at this stage that the environmental flows and the user requirements, agricultural, domestic, industrial, so on, are integrated into the analysis. So it's looking at whether the river can accommodate the user requirements and, the, and still maintain the environmental flows 
or not. Um, if they can't be met, then uh, one has to go uh, to uh, the hydrological yield analysis, uh, calculates the likelihood of being able to maintain the environmental flows and supply the user needs in wet and dry years. If all these requirements can be met, then fine. Uh, the, the, the water allocation plan can be agreed. If not, there has to be an analysis of different scenarios in which either uh, some of the user requirements are uh, given a reduced uh, level of assurance or the environmental flows are uh, compromised. So different scenarios are developed allocating a series of assurance levels to different users um, such as maybe irrigation requirements during the dry season with an assurance of 60% so that six out of 10 years on average the farmers would get all their requirement. Four years uh, out of 10 they would, um, they would have to make do with rather less and so on. And similarly the environmental flows might be um, provided but at a, at a lower assurance level. So then somebody has to make the decision to implement the environmental flows and that may rest with different authorities depending on the scale of the river, whether it's international, national, regional, and so on, and the governance protocols <coughs> of the basin. In areas where there's competition for scarce water resources, the best chance for a decision in favour of implementation of environmental flows will depend on a high confidence assessment and on the support of the majority of stakeholders. Okay, stage D, implementation and compliance monitoring. Um, this is the culminating step of the process, but lasts indefinitely. Uh, so methods of implementation will depend on the availability of storage structures or interbasin transfers or the potential for demand management on any specific river. Uh, it's effective to apply an adaptive approach in which uh, releasing some water down the river by whatever means are currently available is accompanied by an effective monitoring operation that allows for the response of the river to the flows to be assessed so that um, the objectives can be revisited um, in terms of the experience of actually implementing flows and monitoring um, and maybe uh, the flows can be refined either upwards or downwards depending on the results of, of initial implementation. Hello everyone, Professor McLean jumping in at the end of this lecture to provide you with a few take-home messages. Professor O'Keefe presented a series of tasks that are common to a number of holistic environmental flow assessments. He mentioned that they're based primarily on the building block methodology, and this lecture has been a good comprehensive overview of that methodology, but it's also relevant more broadly. For take-home messages, first, you've learned that holistic eFlows assessments are carried out by multidisciplinary teams and generally consist of at least five stages, the scoping, the detailed assessment, integration of results from that assessment, negotiation and implementation of the resulting eFlow recommendations. You learned that the scoping stage may include application of more rapid hydrological methods to identify provisional eFlow levels. You learned about these hydrological methods a couple of units ago and at that time we mentioned that they're often used for provisional recommendations until more detailed assessments as you're learning about this unit can be conducted. Next. The detailed assessment includes both basin and reach scale studies, possibly even including habitat suitability studies to guide detailed recommendations. Now, last week we were looking at habitat suitability methodologies, and it's nice to see that both these and the hydrological approaches can be embedded in the more comprehensive holistic approaches. Next on our list, flow recommendations are determined by integrating the inputs of all the specialists. This is that integration workshop that's professionally facilitated, as Professor O'Keefe uh, described. And it's ultimately those consensus recommendations meeting the requirements of all specialists that are passed on into the negotiation stage and hopefully into implementation. And finally, we learned, and we already knew, and it was re-emphasized that stakeholder engagement is important throughout the process. Stakeholders are critical in the early stages to set uh, relevant objectives for the environmental flow assessment. 
They can also be important sources of information and knowledge, local knowledge about the system itself. And they're critical at the end for negotiation and ultimately for implementation, for monitoring and adaptation of the eFlow recommendations. All right, that's the end of this lecture. Thank you very much.